Good afternoon, everyone. This is Lamont Tyson and the Life Games channel. Tonight is going to be a special night. We have dubbed this young man America's favorite villain. And at this point, I would even go as far as to say America's favorite supervillain. I am talking about Atkins Esteban. He plays a CEDO on Hightown. He's going to be joining us in a few minutes to talk about his role, to talk about the way people have fallen in love with a character that started out on the show killing people from the beginning. And through an intuitive, entertaining, didactive story, this man has become a household item. He is that of the lure of the boy bands from the late 90s. And he's going to be here with us in just a few minutes. I want to shout out everybody that's tuning in to see this man. If you've never seen him do an interview, he gives some of the most dynamic interviews. He articulates what's in his mind to your ear very, very well. And I can't wait to see where this brother is going to go, not just in season three of Hightown, but beyond Hightown. And he's very active in the community. So as soon as Atkins get in here, we'll break down all things season two, season three, and we'll recap some of his best moments. But right now, let me shout out all the people in the building. Suburbia Jones, Nicole Comer, D. Weave, Mega Puff Girl. Oh, man, I love that name. But what does the puff stand for? And why is it mega? Hmm. Muchella, who hang with the fellas. She's in the building. Uh, Matthew Wilson, Chicken Time. <laughs> Stanley Powell, what's up, my brother? Stephen Hackins. He says, Lamont, you put me on to this show last week, and I am done with seasons, both seasons already. Wow. You binge through this whole thing in two weeks? Man, I told you it was good, didn't I? You got to trust your boy when I put you on to these things. Brayface Jerry, what's up? Mark Guy, Tressa C, Eel71, Marcus Terry, Private Pour, what you pouring this private? I got to know. Maurice Neal, my homie. Chris DeSis, all in the building to see the big homie, Osito, in the flesh and in person. Now, before he gets in here, I want us to kind of recap some of the things that happened in season two, especially at the end. We saw Jackie go into the house of Thor's father, Odin. Dude pushes drugs. Dude had already made a pass at Jackie at one point in time. And we had Rebecca Cutter on the show two weeks ago, just breaking down how things are going to go. Wait a minute, ladies and gentlemen, there's breaking news. There's breaking news. There's an Aceto sighting. Wait a minute. Let, let me go take care of my wife so that he don't take my girl and become king of North Carolina. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the big homie, my big homie, Atkins Estimate. How you doing, brother? Good. How are you? Sorry about the delay. There was some technical difficulties going on over here. It's all good. When you get a chance to replay, see if I held it down while you was going. You know, I tried to, you know, I tried to lay that butter on real thick, you know. Got and, you. Uh, let, let the people know exactly what you're working with. So let's just get into it. Okay. How does how does it feel? I, I just got to know as a fan and a person who represents the fans, how does it feel to know you are a part of something that is that special as the 1992 Dream Team that had Michael Jordan on it. From the top down, I mean, from the writer to the person handing out the donuts whose job I want, how does it feel <laughs> to be a part of something that special? It's truly amazing, man. You know, as a as an actor, um, these are the kind of projects you want to work on, the opportunities you want to find for yourself. And, you know, I have to count myself very fortunate that in my career, I've had the opportunity to work on some great projects. 
And High Town is one of those projects where it's like, like you said, from top to bottom, everybody's just mm -hmm. stellar, you know, and it's such a great work environment. Um, and yes, definitely seeing that the show is being so well received, it means a lot. You know, you do stuff, you work on things and um, you put it out there and you don't know what people are going to think about it, you know. So to do something like this and find that, you know, people are really enjoying it, it it's everything. Again, I want to thank you because this is interview number two. And um, a rich billionaire once told me in my ear, time is something that no one should waste and time is something you can't get back. So Absolutely. obviously there's some value here and you want to show support to the fans by giving up your time. We're all very, very grateful for you doing that. Um, this character, Sito. Oh, you got it, man. You got yeah, it. I mean, no, yeah, yeah. Doing the show, like, you know, we talked about this before, like, uh, been a fan of what you've been doing. It's been so cool <laughs> to see. And, I mean, it, you definitely keep me laughing. So uh, <laughs> that's always so a plus. I, so I, ma I made my two-laugh guarantee, right? I did co I did accomplish the two-laugh guarantee. Yeah. <laughs> so how does it feel to know a character that should be an antagonist? has been dubbed and has become America's favorite villain by people young and old. What does that feel like to be the person portraying such a role? It's it's really cool, man. I, you know, like I said, you kind of just do the work and you don't know what will come of it. I didn't, when I was doing the, you know, my, my prep for this, I wasn't thinking that, hey, this is going to be a guy that people like. On paper, you shouldn't like him at all. Right. Um, thinking about what he's done and the position he's played in the show, especially coming out of season one, like Rebecca said in the, the first interview you guys did, like, you know, the first time you meet me, I'm shooting someone in the face. I'm shooting a young woman in the face. And he's very much a nefarious character. But <laughs> um, yeah, so the, it's just one of those things that I just didn't know it was going to go that way. I mean, you know, as things progress, um definitely after the first season i started to see that that um the people were liking the character despite his obvious his dark side so but i mean it wasn't like i went into the next season like oh yeah i'm really gonna lean into this mm -hmm. thing it was just basically like um the writing was set up in a way that you got to see another side of him so that was just an opportunity that was laid out before me and I just ran with what I was given. So, but it, yeah, I'm thankful for it. I'm glad that the fans enjoy it. it it's really cool. Ladies and gentlemen, we are gonna also in this interview, we're gonna be recapping some of his favorite moments and just letting him tell us what was going through his mind as he was performing his craft, showing us, delivering to us the entertainment and also, just kind of as a fan, hear what he had to say about some of the other scenes. Of course, I've got some fan scenes. I've got my favorite scene. We will take a few questions, and we will have his one super fan pop in and pop out, ask <laughs> him a question. <laughs> and to just let you guys know, this will be on the podcast, ladies and gentlemen, the Life Games podcast, probably about an hour or so um, after we're done right here. So. Bear with us, and we will make sure we get you guys rolling. So, hey, everybody. Hi. Hi. How you doing? How does it feel to be associated with this man who America is calling their favorite villain? I I love it. First of all, I'm just coming in carrying in all the mail. Hi. But, yeah, he's not as scary as he looks on TV. <laughs> He's, he's a he's a, a big teddy bear, so don't worry about that. Wait a minute, you can't be giving away corporate secrets now. <laughs> <laughs> now, but see, Atkins already gave that secret away on the last interview, so that just leads us to another great question. Everyone knowing that you are a benevolent person, mm. just how are you able to? Put yourself in position to play a Sito, and some of the things that people have liked about the character, even though mm -hmm. he's been dastardly, nefarious, as you said, mm -hmm. he has a certain swag about himself that people just can't run away from. How have you been able to 
deliver that knowing you're the complete opposite of this character? You know, um, basically, I, um, for me, I started off, I didn't judge the character. Like, mm -hmm. I, I wasn't like, he's a bad guy. He's this, he's that. I was just like, you know, he's a person. That was my uh, square root for this character. And, um, but essentially, it's kind of like, it's a couple different things. Like, and uh, this has been talked about in other interviews before that everybody, when we cut, there's a lot of levity on the set. We're joking. We're, you know, we're keeping it light. The cast, we're having, we're taking a step back from it. So that helps a lot in being able to, to you know, dip and dive into both of those, those things. Um, the environment, you know, I just, there's that level of comfort there where I can go and feel like I can go to those places and, and know that, you know, it's safe, you know? Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, as far as the, you know, playing the character that way, it's just kind of, um, it's, it's, it's actually been kind of fun for me because it was a role that I initially didn't think I was going to get. I, you know, this is not something I've ever, I'd never been a villain before. So really I felt like I kind of had to myself that I could kind of do whatever in that space because I was like, I wasn't trying to follow anything. Um, and I wasn't even sure what it was going to look like. So there was a little bit of freedom, or at least I gave myself a little bit of freedom to be like, well, how would he handle this? How would he, how would he say that? How would he do that? You know? So um, I think that brought a little bit of coloring outside the lines, which maybe is translating as the swagger and that sort of the way that he acts, the sort of laid back kind of energy, never too rushed. Um, right. You know, I've just had, you know, experimenting and seeing, you know, what, who is Osito? And, and by this time now, like, in the first season that was happening by the second season, it was like the character kind of started speaking for himself. Like I look at the script mm -hmm. and Osito is already, it's like, it's already happening. He's saying and moving how he would. And I'm just kind of like letting it happen, you know? Right. And you've been nailing it, which leads to another interesting question. Now that you've played this type of role versus the other roles you've played, which one have you seen to get the most joy out of? Um, <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I've had a lot of fun with this. Like I said, it's just been mm -hmm. something so different. I've done a lot of comedic stuff, which I love. I'm a big fan of comedy. But, right. um, you know, when you get an opportunity to do something that you don't normally do, there is there is a challenge there that's exciting. There's... Um, that the way that you, you know, just get into play and kind of dive in in a way that you just haven't done before, you know, right. that sort of unexplored territory can be really cool. So um, Osito is definitely high on my list as far as characters. And also this is one of the larger roles. I want to say probably the largest role that I've had to date. So it's just been more, more work. And with that, just more for me to kind of explore and do. As of right now, we've got within 12 minutes, over 150 people have tuned in to see you right now in this moment, just to see what's going on. And we're okay. just getting going. I just want to shout out everyone that have been turned on to this show. People hit me up all the time saying they're glad that I turned them on to the show. One guy just said he started the show last week because of my recommendation, finished it yesterday. And then you know what he went and did? Because he loved everybody in that cast, he went looking for everything else you and others was playing in. So he went and caught you in one of your other shows. And then he hit me up. It's like, Lamont, didn't you say he was in the rest? I said, yeah, I caught him in there. Then he went looking for whatever else Rebecca did. Then he went looking for things Amani did. He went looking for everybody. And which brings me to this guy right here, who's going to be on the show tomorrow night. He even caught him in a role playing Suge Knight. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm, I'm just very thankful that whatever value people have been getting out of my crazy reviews, that has brought them to the show so yeah. that we can all share in this art. And this has been well done art. And we're very grateful. Well, well, thankful for you and, you know, spread the word and everybody who's watched and told somebody. And, you know, um, today it's so hard to get like you can't it, it's it's not enough for your show to just be good. 
There's lots right. of good, great shows that people just aren't watching because there's just so much content out there, you know? So right. um, right. when you get people who are excited about your show and, and want to, you know, share it and talk about it, it it's really cool because it, you really had a lot of other things you could have watched outside of right. this. So for anybody <laughs> to take the time to watch it, that means a lot. Well, I want to talk to you just a little bit about season three, what you know of season three. And so this has been this has been the prediction we've been giving, you know. Now, you know, I do tend to go off on my crazy fan theory rant because it's fun. Yeah. And, you know, it, it adds it adds um, mayhem to a story that already has plenty of mayhem. Mm -hmm. So, you know, me and the fans, we came up with this because next season we think you are going to be the king of the cape. Is there any truth that you're going to be running the cape now that considering what we've seen going on with Charmaine, does that mean a seat toe got to step in and be the king of the cape? You know what? I um, I'm completely being completely honest. I have no idea. I don't know <laughs> one line of what is supposed to be happening in season three, but mm -hmm. um. And the thing is, is that with Hightown, you just never know. Every time the, the writers, Rebecca, you have to hats off to her and all the writers. Yes. That when you think you're on to whatever's going on, it's completely flipped. It's switched. It's not that at all. So I'd love to sit here and say, yeah, you know, Cito's going to be running the cake. <laughs> but you never know what could happen. Anything's possible. Um, that would be awesome. That would, I, you know, love to see what that looks like um, for the character. But um, I just don't know. <laughs> so I cannot fulfill uh, that, that wish right now. But um, fingers crossed, we'll see. Well, when, when they do make you the king of the cape, I'm going to get the fan to let me use this image, and I'm going to send you the T-shirt. I'm going to send you T-shirt copy. <laughs> you will be officially crowned king of the cape. So <laughs> we're going to nice, make it happen nice. for you. So let's would, get into – appreciate that. Yes, sir. Let's get into recapping. Mm -hmm. the, the 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 chaos, the fun chaos that happened in the season. You had yourself a few favorite scenes, and we're going to recap some of those right now because we want to mm -hmm. know what was your insight, what was you trying to convey to the audience. And I think I'm going to take you right to the one that I, I think is your favorite. In this moment, the way you lit up on the screen with Monica, you knew you wasn't playing this. This you knew you weren't gonna be playing this season, and so here's the <laughs> clip where not only did you bang the table twice, you you floated her away like a little butterfly. Take a look. <laughs> Why you gave Junior a hot shot to cover it up? That's what you think? I fucking killed him. Fuck you. Well, what then? I love that boy. I put him on a bus to Miami. Put some bills in his pocket. Gave him a place to stay. A new life. I'm gonna leave that shit alone. If you care about Junior, how are you gonna let him take a body off your plate? Think he gives a shit about that now? You should know that boy had your back for reals. If it wasn't for him, things would have gone differently for you that day. Fly away now, little starling. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> Talk to us about that. What was you trying to how was you trying to convey that piece of artwork to us, the fans? Because it was powerful to just have you two in the same room. That was just powerful by itself. And then the exchange you went through and it kind of felt like you put the explanation mark on Jackie because she walked away literally with nothing to say. Yeah, that, that scene. And, you know, I tried to pick scenes that you guys hadn't already um, gone over that you and Rebecca didn't go over. But um, that scene in particular to me is such a cool scene. And I don't know if you realize that that, um, that's actually from the episode that Monica directed. So um, get an opportunity to work with her, which I didn't get to do much of in the first season. It was just so cool. And then also to be directed by her was really just, uh, it was an amazing experience. She's such a great director. I mean, she's an actress, so she, she understands where we're coming from with the process and what we're trying to do. Like literally we sat down and it was like, we're doing a scene study and like an acting class, you know, we just kind of went for it. And, um, but yeah, I feel like that's such a cool moment because literally this is the first time we're seeing each other since, you know, we tried, I tried to kill her. She shot right. me. You know? That's huge to sit down at a table across from somebody who tried to kill you, you know? Mm -hmm. And 
Um, and also it was, it was a really um, interesting moment because it clears up some things about the situation with Junior. A lot of people after the first season felt like, um, like I tried to kill him or I gave him a hot shot or something like that. And it really illuminates the fact that, you know, Osito really cared about Junior. Like he yes. wasn't, you know, it wasn't like he just threw him under the bus and tried to, you know, off him. Like he really had feelings for him. Like he was, you know, he made a bond with him. So that to me was really such an interesting scene. And then you also have the the nod to Silence of the Lambs with the fly away now, little star. Yes. yes. Yeah. And I think that's such a, you know, I mean, it's just iconic. So when I read that, I was like, oh, wow, that's so cool, you know? Hmm. Um, so, yeah, the whole scene is just, you know, it's such a great moment. And also just, just like all the way through from beginning to end, it's just tension, you know? Like, yes. it's such a, you know, this this thick in that moment where it's just like, what are you trying to figure out? You know, it, it, she's she's poking and prodding and it's like, there's not much, be it, it's just a great, great scene to me. And another thing that came from that scene, we find out that it wasn't just you, Aceto, that loved that boy. Monica did too. Mm -hmm. And the question she might have had about whether or not Junior had her back, you answered that for her. Yeah. yeah. Junior had her back. And yeah. if it would not been for Junior, Monica might be in the body box. Yeah. Yeah. And the other, the other very interesting thing to me, and this is like getting very deep in the dissection of this scene, is that um, we find out in this, there's like a, a second of it's like, we have a mutual friend here, you know, mm -hmm. and it creates like a weird kind of moment in between the two of them where it's like they both really loved junior you know right and yet you know rewind maybe a few weeks you know whatever they were shooting each other you know so <laughs> right. um yeah it's just a very very interesting scene to me i loved you know being able to to do it to, to work with monica she's fantastic it was it was awesome shouts out to monica we i'm going to do my best to get her on the show too i just want to hear some of her perspectives and this scene is going to be replayed because to me, this was one of the better scenes. This was an iconic scene. Everything mm -hmm. you said about it made it iconic, but the common denominator was just the love of junior and two people wanted to get to a point of closure. So mm -hmm. that just made the thing beautiful. So I was grateful to see that scene be picked up on your roles. Yeah. We have yeah. another one because there was tension with a seat when it felt like almost everybody, <laughs> the only person that felt like it didn't have tension with was Charmaine. Yeah. So we have a, we have another scene where there's just big tension between a Cito and a certain character. I'm gonna just let you see this one, and we gotta talk about this. Who? I figure out who would have the cojones to come from my family, and I can only think of one person. If I'm finna put a body in the ground. I don't play around like you. Send other people to handle my business. If I kill your slack ass cousin, I send him back to you in pieces with a signed note. Believe that. Mm. Got to be more careful. Split that tension with a strike of lightning. Cut to be <laughs> the man slamming on the table, standing up, looking at each bro. The only thing that you could have done to poke him even more was to call him F.A. Oh, Lord, <laughs> Talk to me about this scene, man. This was unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah, there. Um, this once again, just and calling back to the the caliber of talent that's on this show, Amari Nolasco is just, he's, uh, he's amazing. And mm -hmm. he's so good to play off of because he's so, you know, he just gives you so much. He's a, just an amazing scene partner. There's just so much for you to work with. And, you know, just coming in, obviously, you know, this is a big, when this episode happens, when this scene happens, you know, this is a big moment because, you know, these two have been, he tried to kill me, you know? Right. And, <laughs> We're coming from season one where I did everything. Like he, I mean, obviously Renee got him out, but if those bodies didn't get gone, you got a problem there, right? 
So right. it's kind of like this moment of it's like, and I would have kept my mouth shut if you would have just let me rock in prison. But you, day <laughs> one, the very first day coming into prison, someone's trying to stab me. <laughs> right. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it's such a great scene, a great moment. And um, yeah, I mean, just walking in, I'm, 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 and you know, obviously, I love him, Maori, but just when when we walk into the to the room where the cell is or the waiting room, excuse me, in a minute they say action. It's just like. Whew, you know, and um, this is also an interesting moment for Osito because this is after he's, you know, he's he's out of the walker. He's healed. He's in a better place. Mm-hmm. He has he's got some status back. So he's got a little bit more a little bit more air in his chest than he did when we saw him <laughs> at the beginning of the, right. you know, um, the beginning of the season. Uh, so and um yeah, so walking into there and especially not not even knowing that that's who was waiting, you know, because they didn't say, hey, um, Frankie is in the waiting room. They just said somebody's <laughs> here to see you, you know. So and we thought you would be happy. We thought you would be happy to get a break because they had done switch your new hot therapist. I told you in episode one, mm-hmm. they didn't bring that hot therapist for nothing. So you were getting stretched by the man who you won't feel in any way. So mm-hmm. instead of it being like, okay, I'm getting a break from this therapist, I don't know who it is, but I'm glad to see him. You walk in there and you see this face. Yeah. Whew. So it's all around already a bad day. And mm-hmm. so, and you can tell from the moment that, you know, I see him, it's on, you know? And um, yeah, it's just a really, really cool scene, man. You know, and, and like I said, with the Maori, it's just, uh, an embarrassment of riches as far as what he gives and you know his character is so broad as well so it's like you have these two titans kind of opposing right. each other and you know the whole time it's like sparks are flying every little moment when he does the little hand touch you know uh there's just so much happening there even so much being said so much not being said like even in the silence there's yeah. there's action you know so yes. And especially in that that this this final moment here is just like oh my gosh like are they gonna is it about to go down right in here in the in the waiting room you know <laughs> so, but and I the think- score the score with that yeah. that moment was unbelievable I mean it it just intensified the it just intensified that moment right there mm-hmm. that score um, wow man mm. yeah Mm-mm. yeah. High Town would never die, ladies and gentlemen. It never stops. I'm not going to let it stop. It's going to keep rolling until we get right into season three. Now, this is going to be a scene I got for you, Atkins. Mm -hmm. It doesn't involve you, but from just the little polls I have personally done on my channel and some other social media outlets, people have this scene either one or two for their favorite moments of the entire season I can't wait to see how you react to it. Um, let's get it popping. I'm trying, God. I'm trying <laughs> not to laugh at that because it's not supposed to be funny. So, Atkins, somebody just got shot. Somebody just got shot. And, 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 and my wife rewind that scene 10 times. And she mm-hmm. kept telling me, she was like, Lamont, there's going to be a scene. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but you're going to want to see it over and over. <laughs> that scene got rewind like 20 times in this house. And every time I laugh and I feel bad, what was going through your mind as you saw this play out from right there on the sidelines? Yeah, this scene is, it's a great scene. Um, and obviously there is comedy in it. You know, it's just the... <laughs> The well with the bravado that she has when she, right, when she right. makes that statement, and for the gun to just go off, you know, and Ooh. it's there. But and also Luis Guzman, he is his character is just so even in that moment of intense just panic and craziness, he's just bringing so much, you know. And um, mm-hmm. I think just the unexpected nature of what happened, you can't help but kind of laugh at it. But altogether, the scene was just amazing. I mean, Riley, uh, love her. She is just, she went for it in this scene. She did. Yeah, it's amazing. It's just so good. And I love it because it's one of those moments when you really see that Renee is not just, just, you know, on on a boat, 
just floating down the river, at letting life kind of just carry her wherever she, wherever it takes right. her. She's very much an active participant in what's happening. And it's just like, especially in that moment, like initially it's like, well, she wasn't trying to kill Jorge, but Jorge shot. So why not capitalize <laughs> on this moment? You know, I think a lot of people may make the mistake and think that Renee's kind of just like, oh, you know, what am I going to do? But I feel like there's very right. much intention here. And um, very much a, like, I'm looking out for what's best for me, you know, and for my mm -hmm. child. So, um, and not to say that she doesn't, she doesn't love Ray or she doesn't even maybe had feelings for Frankie, you know, but right. um, this is not someone who's just completely helpless waiting for the, the next best thing to happen. She's actively shaping her future. And in this moment is like, she, you see that she makes that decision. She was like, I can get rid of him. He's a huge problem to me. And I can be done with that problem right now. And all I literally have to do is just get out of this room, you know? Get so out. Get it's out. A, yeah, it's a great scene. And when I read it on the paper, I was just like, I mean, I got the script and I was like, this is insane. You know, like this is insane. Wild. Yes. Yeah. And, and again, you uh, know, <laughs> Hightown hit, hit the nail. We, we saw in this particular scene, I made a comment about how they had our makeup looking a little darker mm -hmm. the week before this episode came out. And I even made mention to the fans, are they getting ready to let something dark or take her down a dark road? Mm -hmm. And then what happens? Mine is bigger than yours. Bop. <laughs> <laughs> Call Frankie. Nope. Yeah. Uh, get the phone. Nope. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to come back in here, pull that phone out, lock you in. Wow. Yeah. Well, you know, that's wow. the thing about... Um television film whatever it's it's a collaborative effort so it's it's all those things it's the the makeup it's the lighting it's the everything like you're telling a story from multiple places the actors are telling the story but also like i said you, or like you said excuse me um the the makeup the the wardrobe everything it's all telling the story there you know so that was very a very good observation on your behalf hey man i gotta do, look they be trying to counsel me. So I have to do what I have to do to have some value to the YouTube world and keep everybody smiling. So I, I better I better pay attention to the little small details like that, Absolutely. especially considering I had to cut Renee loose as one of my TV wives. I had to cut her loose because she keeps making crazy decisions. And so, you know, even though I'm frustrated with her, she looked immaculate. With this dark makeup on, I still had to say bye bye and get back in the good graces with my wife. So she did let me back in. I'm she glad to hear me, that. She she let me but she let me out the doghouse. But she said you better be more judicious when you pick these TV wives. Stop picking the ones that go nuts. That's what she said. <laughs> <laughs> well, Got a few more nice for you. Her. I, I, hey, look, <laughs> I, I, it's two women in this house, and now they tell me exactly what to do. <laughs> Here's another one for you. This one is one that you said you liked as well. You're not in this scene, but you enjoyed it. And this is another one of those top three that the fans have said that they like. So we're going to sit back and see how you as a fan and someone working on the art felt about it in the moment. And it's kind of got a funny twist to it, too. Are you guys here to turn yourselves in? You don't scare me. Because I know you're not going to do shit. Swing your dick all you want. I got seven and a half inches right here. You ducked hey. off. You look scared. Everything okay out here, Jacqueline? We're cool. I don't believe you. You need to get your low rent hoodlum ass off my porch. I called the police. Watch your pussy, puta! Mmm. 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 Great Talk scene. about that one, my brother. Yes, Lord, and Jackie, bravado. Like, bro, you don't, you don't scare me. You ain't tough, even mm -hmm. though I got Ali Bobby in my head. I ain't worried about you or your muscle back there. Yeah. Talk about it. Such a – the thing that I, I – one of my favorite things about Jackie is, is how she's willing to, to step to anybody. Like, the That's right. she's not afraid. Or at no. least she, you know, she finds herself in these situations where typically you're just like, what are you doing? I would never, you know, when she goes to go see Frankie in season one in jail, 
It's a right, very tense right. situation. It takes a lot of gall to to go and be like, you know, face down the big bad guy and be like, yeah, I got your number and I'm coming after you, right? Yeah. Um, coming to see me, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, not afraid sitting across from me, telling me what time it is, you know, and, and going hard at me, you know? Right. Um, sitting here, coming to her home and finding people, killers on her doorstep and not backing down. You know, like she, right. you want, I mean, a lot of people, you know, talk about Jackie and how she's a mess and how, you know, she's, you know, the, the stuff with her addiction and how, you know, it always gets in the way or something happens, but you have to give her the credit that it's at the base of her. She's still just such a strong and a brave person. And in so many situations when others may be fearful to move forward or do something, she's going to do something, you know? And that's one of the things that I've always loved about that character. And this scene highlights that perfectly. She's got two people, Frankie and Zuleta, right at her door, literally blocking her way to her front step. And she's like, I got one too. Like, what what are we going to (laughs) do? You know, that is such (laughs) an uh, an awesome moment for that character. And it just lets you know that she just, she can give as good as she gets. You know, she stands tall and I, I love it. Yeah, when you talk about Jackie, you mentioned just how brave she is, how tough she is. Mm -hmm. And she also, if you recall this season, she went and confronted Frankie at the club. In his club, he pulled out his gun, she, and what? Yeah. But there's there's also, right, she's tough. But there's also something I picked up on, and maybe I'm reading into too much, but there is a capacity to be loved. She wants to be loved. She wants someone to recognize that she's someone to be adored. And mm-hmm. I don't think anyone has been able to fulfill that with Jackie to this point. And so that's, you know, one major question that I think we've got going into season three. Will Jackie find someone that she can honestly say loves her the way that she wants to be loved. I think that's going to be a big question as well, because she has capacity to have a big heart. We absolutely, seen that. yeah, yeah, for mm-hmm. sure. I, I would so now we're down, explored. right, right. Yeah. We're now down to the last two scenes, and they both involve you. I'm going to save my personal favorite for last mm-hmm. because I made a correct prediction. But this is another one of those scenes. Where it just, as Razor Ramon from WWE said, it oozes machismo. I got to give it to you. Here you go, my brother. Never going to let my ass up out of there. Can't keep a real one down. And the worst kind of criminal at that, a snitch, an asshole, thinks he's got a friend in blue. Well, I'm here to let you know we're not fucking friends. You Mm. fuck up one time, and I'm going to put your ass back in there for good. Just like your girl Charmaine. Better watch that fucking back. Don't worry about me, Sarge. You need to worry about your own damn self. Is that a threat? Fuck around and find out. <laughs> Words don't do enough. It, that, 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 look, both of you guys. Oh, my goodness. Oh my goodness. That was more intense than you and Frankie. That that was, and then on top of that, after you have such a heated, intense moment, you getting into a cab that's Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer, and you look tough and hard as hell, and tell somebody, worry about your own effing self. Talk to me about that one, my brother. You and no, my, yeah. you made um, every man in America that wants to look tough, you made us feel like we got hope to be tough. Absolutely. I, um, <laughs> the whole scene with the cab, and I remember you, I, I saw the interview with you and Rebecca and she mentioned it. And <laughs> I, that day I was just like, I'm, you know, we're doing the blocking, we're going through it. I'm like, all right, I'm going to walk over here. I'm going to go into the cab. And I'm looking at the cab and, you know, it's got the, the reindeer ears and the red <laughs> nose on the front. You know, you don't see the red nose. But I was just like, in my mind, because I'm, you know, I, I like to joke and I like to play, but I'm looking like, wow, I'm really getting into a Rudolph, a Rudolph taxi. Like, I'm over here telling him, like, watch your back, essentially. Or, you know, right. you never know what might happen to you. And then I just step into a Rudolph car. 
just drive away. <laughs> so in my mind, I was like, man. Um, and that wasn't me griping about it. I was just like, okay, well, I'm going to. I'm going to have to not think about that because if I think that it's silly, if I think it's, you know, if I think it's goofy or funny or whatever, that's going to translate. Right. So I just was like, whatever, as far as I was concerned, I'm about to step into a, a F-15 and take off out of there, you know? So <laughs> um, the, uh, the situation with Alan and Don Norwood this whole season has oh. just been, just man just a monster he is so good yeah uh just in every way and um but you know this has been building with every episode every interaction and it's an interesting moment because up until this point i haven't been i haven't been i've been at his mercy right this has been mm -hmm. his world i've had to try to figure out a way to try to survive in the the circumstances that he set up for me Finally, we find ourselves in a position where essentially I'm kind of at a equal footing with him in this moment after having to kind of take whatever from him. And it's just a nice moment to be like, I'm not in there and I don't have to deal with you and I don't have to sit here and talk to you at all, you know. And um, so, yeah, it's a really great moment. And I think that it's so charged and, you know, and the getting closer and closer and closer. And in that final moment, I think it's just like you know what? I don't have to sit here and talk to you. This is, this is really funny. I'm out. I'm going to go do what I want to do because I'm free now. And um, right. I think there's an interesting little moment that a lot of people didn't catch is that the, the fuck around and find out that's actually kind of a call back to, to junior in season one. Because if you remember the first time I took junior to new Bedford, I told him, you know, not to mess with these it's Cape Verdeans. Oh. And he goes into the room with Uncle Wayne, and Uncle Wayne's oh. like, right? Remember? And he's like, uh, he's I say he's tougher than he looks. And he's like, Are you? And he says, fuck around and find out. Find out. <laughs> I got I, I gotta I gotta retire from this job because I should have <laughs> caught that. Lord have mercy. I missed I, ladies and gentlemen that follow me. I'm so sorry I dropped the ball. And I, one of the reasons I dropped the ball was because I was too busy catching another innuendo. You had to step to Sergeant Allen when he invoked the name of Charmaine. Because mm -hmm. for a moment there, you was kind of just entertaining him, just having a little fun. Yeah. But the minute he said he's going to be messing with Charmaine, doing her wrong, mm -hmm. throwing her in jail, this is what you look like. You stepped in here. You got – I, I literally thought you might be going to swing on him because you got in that <laughs> man's face. That was another innuendo. That's what I spent my time. Talk to me about what was you trying to tell us when he mentioned he was going to try to make Charmaine do hard time because obviously Cedo has a, I'm not going to say a weak spot. I'm going to say he has a, a growing spot for Charmaine. Mm -hmm. I think that Osito is somebody who does not, I've said this before, I don't think, I don't count him as somebody who has many friends, many people who he would say that he trusts. But if you are somebody who he deems as somebody that is in his circle or somebody who he cares about, somebody, a friend, then he's got you no matter what, you know, right. with Junior, same. And with where he literally was willing to kill somebody instead of killing him. And I think that that has been placed on to Charmaine as well, that, you know, um, it's almost like a little sister kind of situation, like. Um, right. you know, when he would come up there, this is obviously stuff that we did see, but, you know, it kind of alluded to the fact that, and she even said, you always did right by me, you know, right. Whenever, yeah. You know, I'd come to uncle Wayne's house, you know, and you can kind of see it. It's such a small moment, but in the first time I'm meeting her, there's a bit of that, that familiar kind of energy, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that he's just seen her as somebody, you know, she came to him, to, to him in a moment when he was at his lowest and was able to lift him up, you know, by providing me the drugs while I was in the green, I was able to have a pretty comfortable situation over there, you know? Yeah. It just, just came out of nowhere to do that. You know, obviously I was suspicious at first, but it panned out and it turned out to be a good thing and it made, made my life a lot easier. So I feel like that further put her in a place of somebody who he's like, all right, you're one of my people, you know? And, mm -hmm. 
um, for Allen to say what he said, you know, I think that Osito is somebody who isn't typically riled or typically he's not someone who you kind of catch off guard easily. But right. that moment, we got him fired up, you know, because yes. when it comes to his people, those select few people, he's he's about it, you know, um, exactly. And especially because it's kind of it's also even like like and Osito has that code. And to say that about a child, Charmaine is still a child, you know, to say that you're going to you're going to make her you're going to throw her in there. And, you know, I don't know. And I know what he's been putting me through. So what is he going to do to her? You know? Right. Um, yeah, man. How much more, how much, how much, or how difficult is he going to make her life where she's at? So there's a right. lot, it's a very loaded kind of thing there. So, um, but also, you know, so as quickly as he loses control, he's the kind of person who can also reset and get back to that cool, calm demeanor. Yeah. Keep moving, you know? So he snapped, I, he snapped back right here in this moment. He mm -hmm. snapped back. Yeah. He snapped right on back. Snapped back, but also let it know that it's like, and this is a, an interesting moment for the whole arc of the season. We've seen a very softer side of Osito, right? Yes. Very different from the the Osito that we met in the first season. Obviously, the circumstances are different, but in that fuck around to find out, you find out it, it very much kind of reinforces that I'm still that guy, you know? Like, right. I'm still the guy that kills people, you know? So I'm not to be played with, and now. I'm free. So it was a really, I mean, altogether, just such a cool moment. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm literally so thankful. This whole season, this whole experience has been amazing. As an actor, it's just like, it's such a gift. Everything has right. just been so rich and so much to play with. Um, the writers can't speak enough about them. Rebecca, what she's put together has been just amazing. And we feel the same way. Um, we, we feel the complete same way. We, we like our minds to be stretched when we're reviewing these shows. And Hightown just took us all over the place and did it in a very entertaining way. So I've got a new nickname for you. One that you will love. Since your name is Atkins Estimate, I'm going to start calling you A&E, Action and Entertainment. That's one of your nicknames, my brother. <laughs> I love it. I love so, it. I, I as we move, <laughs> take it, man. I got another one for you, too, but I'm going to save that one for the end. Gotcha. As we get out of here, this is going to be the last scene we'll let you recap because your boy, me, Lamont Tyson, Mr. Life Games, mm -hmm. I foretold it this coming. You do not bring a therapist this hot <laughs> on a show like this with this magnitude for absolutely nothing. So, ladies and gentlemen, and by the way, before you got up here, I was poking fun with the crowd that because of the way you all have put these stories together in two seasons and just popped up on the scene, you guys are kind of like the hotness of those 90s boy bands. You know, the new additions, the the um, um, NSYNCs, and y'all like that now. And mm -hmm. so, Cito, he's a heartthrob because he has a code. And because he brings purple flowers, when he says he's going to have purple flowers, he brings purple flowers. Ladies yes. and gentlemen, take a look at this. He wasn't doing that in physical therapy. Yeah, well, I needed that. You needed it. <laughs> I like this a lot. No, baby. I got to take this. I'm sorry. Yeah. What was that about? You really want to know? If we're going to do this, I need to know what I'm getting myself into. Mmm. Mmm. <laughs> Osito the just, heartthrob. Uh, 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 look, bro, get used to it. You, you are a heartthrob. I mean, they know about you now. You are a heartthrob. Look, your your your, your sweetie pie over there might have to go get um capital security because you are a bona fide heartthrob at this moment. Oh, Not only are goodness. you a heartthrob, but a lot of people missed it. But you did deliver the flowers. They're right flowers over there beside the lamp. I caught the flowers, but this is what the people had to say about that. Mm -hmm. I'm fine with it, but a lot of people want to see you at the door delivering the flowers. I, mm -hmm. I mean, they was there. That's how I look yeah. at it. They was there, and I'm fine with that. But this is the other thing I got to say. Janelle, the man is about to be the king of the cape. Now, Janelle, 
you're going to have to do better than putting this man in a full-size bed. My daughter bed bigger than this. Can you put a king in a full-size... Can you put a king in a king bed? Look, let me show you this again. He's the king of the cape. You don't put the king of a cape in a purple full bed smaller than my 14-month-old daughter's bed. Atkins, talk to me about this scene. Janelle did a great job in the scene, by the way. And yes. Just She's talk phenomenal. to me about how you felt about doing this scene. Well, let me just say, interesting story about that bed. When I, we were getting ready to do the scene, <laughs> I I was like walking through the sets on stage and I hadn't seen the set for Janelle's room. And they're like, oh, yeah, this is Janelle's room. And I walked in and I saw the bed and I was like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I was like, I took myself, I was like, I don't know if that bed is big enough. But um, <laughs> we laid on it. Me and actually one of the producers, Ellen, Ellen Schwartz, who's amazing. We laid on it. I'm sure there's a picture of that somewhere. But we laid on it together. And I was like, okay, actually, you know, this, this could work. But, you know, right. Janelle has been living her life. You know, she was not expecting Osito to pop into her world. So she didn't have time to run the rooms to go or Ikea or you know, wherever, you, <laughs> wherever you go get your bed from, you know, so uh, in the future, hopefully, you know, we'll see what happens. Maybe we'll remedy that. But um, right. as far as the scene goes, just, I mean, um, from the moment I did a chemistry read with um, Crystal Lee Brown, she is fantastic. If you haven't seen her work, she is just, I mean, just, uh, mm -hmm. just tremendous talent. Um, right. If you haven't seen The Good Lord Bird, she does some phenomenal work in that project. It's it's unbelievable. And I was just gushing when I had a chance. When they, it was like, it's her. I, I, we, we sat down. We had many conversations. We had Zoom talks and stuff like that. And I just couldn't tell them how amazing I thought she was. Like, I was like, I've seen your work. I'm just so glad that we're going to be working together. And she's just wonderful. And it was just the whole arc of that story was so so great to watch and like I said just another look at that character you know another side of that mm -hmm. character and she you know it was it was she was very much like it, the fight of like is this gonna happen is this gonna work so many people wanting to see it work um it was just a really cool thing that's not a thing I ever thought I would never thought I'd be in a position where I'm like a love interest or heartthrob or whatever you know that's not something when I was like Mapping out my career, that is not something that I saw myself uh, huh. being attuned to or attached to. So this is all of it is just like a surprise to me. But um, I was just like, you know, doing the work with someone who was, you know, once again, one of those scene partners who you love to work with and give so much, you know. So right. it was um, yeah, that last scene was a very good kind of punctuation. I know a lot of people have been asking about um and, and to back around to the flowers, like I was like, I feel like you don't need to hit that nail. Like, you know, like you see the flowers, the flowers are there. Maybe, you know, that's a moment. But also, you know, there's a lot of things to think about. The length of the, the episode exactly. has to be factored in. So it's like, do we have the time for to show me coming with the flowers, you know? Um, right. Yeah. But I thought it was a, a great scene, a great punctuation to that arc. It was, you know, it was really cool. And to Janelle's point, <laughs> she embodied sisters for real. Mm -hmm. Because when you answered that phone, <laughs> I always have to warn folks now. <laughs> when you upset a woman and they feel like there's a reason for suspicion, I jokingly tell people women become every branch of the alphabets in the government, the CIA, <laughs> the FBI, and this is the look of a face of a woman that's looking over your shoulder seeing exactly who the hell is calling my baby. Who yeah. is calling my baby? And she wasn't even trying to be punctual about it. She's like, I'm nosy. Hmm. Yeah. Who, yeah. Who you call? I mean, in that situation, it's almost like, can you blame her? She li literally Absolutely not. fresh out of prison. Um Right. I got a million dollars worth of bail paid by somebody. Um, and I'm getting a phone call now. Who, who, who's calling you now? <laughs> you know, so I think she has all the right to be asking those questions. And that's what I was going to say. I know a lot of people are like, oh, uh, is he honest with her in that moment? Does he tell her? Mm -hmm. That's something for season three. But um, oh, oh, <laughs> oh, oh, no, he didn't do it like 
<laughs> no, he didn't do a slow <laughs> See, he, this guy is a this is a seasoned actor right here. No, he didn't <laughs> set us up like that. <laughs> Just slide that one in, yeah. Um, yeah, that's that that's something for a later date, but um yeah, it's yeah, just just a, a an, an interesting moment. And yes, obviously, I think she has every right to be suspicious uh, of what I'm doing, who I'm talking to, what I'm up to. I don't want to know too. And like she said, this is I'm in this now too. So, right. um, yeah. So it'll be so very. What we did, we do know that she's in it now. She's in it to win it. Um, she made that very clear in that moment. She's in it. Yeah. She's, yeah, she's she didn't give back the truck, and well, I don't know that. I I I I don't know for sure. Like I, you, you we never see the tail end of that. She just said she mm -hmm. didn't accept it, but logistically, you know, we never hear about it again. So I think that's still up in the air unless season three rolls around and she pulls up in it. Then we'll know. But oh. Um, Season three roll up, she's gonna come in a range or she's gonna be a brand new Janelle. Then she her favorite color might go from purple to gold by then. That's what's gonna happen. To her. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I um yeah, I, I would say that in that moment, I, I think that because I feel like her character, and let me not talk for Crystal, but just from what I got off the page, I feel like um that she really was not trying to like this wasn't like you know. She was really trying to fight this. You know, I really feel like mm -hmm. that Osito really had to kind of win her over and show her something different, show her that he really wasn't just some other guy, you know? Um, so I feel like it was all very gradual in the in the steps. And also, like, when you talk about she's in it now, I feel like the, the more she allowed, the more that she was willing to, the moment when she tells me that they're coming to search my cell, that in itself mm -hmm. is a huge... You, oh, you're you're not just dipping a toe in; you're in the jacuzzi, <laughs> you know. Yes. So, yes. um, yeah, that's that's a huge moment, and it's like there's this every time they have an interaction, it's like what's it going to be? There's a, a battle there to be fought, you know, and um, right, and ultimately it ends up in this place now, and I feel like she's invested. So, um, what that what comes with that territory, yet to be seen, but and how much of that is she aware of? Yet to be seen. <laughs> Bless the writers, because I would not want to have to be the one working with the writers to finish this story, because there are so many dynamic parts to this thing. You can take, mm -hmm. just for example, your character. You can take you and Charmaine's relationship several places. You could take you and Janelle's relationship several places. But you also, this season, got a cellmate who... He decided he wanted to be a king. Yeah. And he went yes. and he gutted up Frankie. Y'all are got a relationship going on now. So I Absolutely. mean, just your story alone is a story in itself. And mm -hmm. bless bless Rebecca Cutter and that writing team. Cause man, who they are doing it. And I, I appreciate what they do. And you know, because like mm -hmm. I said, all these interesting things, all the all these new uh arenas that I've had to kind of play in have all been set up by the writers. You know, it wasn't like I went to them and was like, hey, what if Osito did this? You know, like I get the scripts and I'm like, wow, this is this is really interesting and this is really cool and I'm thankful for it. So they have done a, a bang up job time after time, episode after episode, and and creating just a really compelling and interesting story for all the characters, you know? Right. They did. Ladies yeah. and gentlemen, this will be on the podcast 20 minutes after we're done right now. Be sure to go download, check us out. You can hear this in-depth interview with Atkins Estima. He plays a seat on Hightown, has a bivy of other shows he's been in, and he's going to continue to be lighting up the scoreboard when it comes to these roles in Hollywood. As of now, before we get him out of here, we want to take a couple of questions from the fans. And Atkins, we have none other than your super fan who is completely turned on by your swag. Ladies and gentlemen, warming up in the bull pit. It's our, it's our favorite Moochie. Hey How you doing, Moochie? Moochie. What's up, hey. Osito? Hey. How you doing? I am good. It's I funny. Good. When, you, when, you good. when you when you met last time, you made a prediction. And I as know. you were saying it, as you were saying it, I was like, wow. Wow, she's on it. She's on it. <laughs> Put them crowns up because the king of the cape is here. 
<laughs> Here's the king. There's the king. <laughs> okay, so I got two questions. Okay. I will be quick. Um, where do you what do you have to go in your mind to bring this character of Osito out? You know, um when I initially started working on the character. I actually, I wasn't thinking about the dark side, all that stuff. You know, I was just thinking about like, he's a person just like everybody else. And that was like literally square one for building this character was like, he's a person, especially because I saw that he wasn't like in that first season where he has that, um, that monologue where he talks about the first time he killed somebody, you hear that there's pain there, that there's, that really he kind of got this life kind of forced onto him, you know? given different circumstances, he could have been anything, you know? And I feel like that's the truth for a lot of people who are in those situations. It's like, this is what they had. This is the cards that they were dealt and they played with them. So I started off just being like, he's just somebody with his heart, essentially. That's That was the first place I went to. All that other stuff just gets piled on, but it, the, the center of it is that. Right. Okay, and how do you feel about some of the things that your character has done? <laughs> <laughs> I have good questions tonight, right? That's, yeah, very good <laughs> question. Um, as far as my feelings about it, um, obviously he's done some very terrible things. Um, but I don't think that those things aren't, are just like easy for him. You know, I don't think that killing people is just something that uh, he doesn't enjoy it by any means it's a job, you know, so it's not personal. It's just a job, but I think it weighs on him. I think it's taxing. Um, so those things I'm like, that's, it's hard, but also I'm, like I said, I'm trying not to judge the character. I'm trying to just be like walking his shoes. And, and, but with these circumstances, like understanding who he is and how he's had to, to live, if I could kind of go and build a backstory for him, what would I be thinking about this character and what makes a person do the kind of things that he does? What makes him respond to people in the way that he responds to people? How he just like literally with Junior, taking him to a fast food place and making him beat somebody up to toughen him. What kind of things had to happen to him in his childhood and in his growing up to make him think that that's a good way to, to sort of toughen someone up or to, you know, to kind of be a mentor to somebody? Literally in that moment, he's mentoring him. You know, but he's making him commit a violent act. So um, it's hard in a lot of his moments. But also, like I said, there is a lot of heart there, too. So there is the, the caring things that he does, the way that he looks out for people who matter to him. So mm -hmm. all of those things are have to be considered. I, I feel like we did get a backstory when you said that the Haitian side didn't accept you mm -hmm. and the Dominican side didn't accept you. So mm -hmm. it was like you were kind of like a loner where you had to find your way. So I feel That's like we got a somewhat of a backstory. So I like the, I like when you told that part. Yeah. In this and you know, it's funny. That's actually something that I can kind of relate to him because I am first generation Haitian. So a lot of times I do feel that I'm not Haitian enough, right? Because I wasn't born there. And a lot of times people who are from there will make you feel like if you can't speak the language properly, you know, that sort of thing. But also I was born in America, but I'm not, you know, like don't feel super uh, attached to that either. You know, it's kind of some weird place in the middle culturally, you know, I didn't grow up like uh, in our household. It wasn't like a typical American household. So it's this sort of weird limbo in between both where you're just left to try to figure it out yourself. And I feel like that's a lot of what comes from that character. Okay. <laughs> right, right. I, look, I think you're gonna be king of the cape. I already made my video. If y'all didn't check it out, go to, go to my channel and check out Will Osito be the king of the cape and check out my little theory video I did. Thank well, you. if yeah. you're as good as you were with the last one, then we should definitely pay attention. So. Exactly. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you, Moochie. Thank you. And by the way, the fan art that I've been showing you, this right here, that was created by your super fan, Moochie. I just wanted to say ah, that for the end. Okay. Yeah, that was created yeah. by Moochie. Thank you, Moochie. So as I... As I get you out of here, my man, as always, so grateful for your time, so grateful for you giving back to the fans, 
keeping us engaged because I'm not trying to let Hightown go away. No, it never stops with me. I'm going to keep the, the circle going. But I would like to know when you as an artist are not performing, what are you watching on TV? You know, give the fans a glimpse at the different things you like to watch and enjoy um, in your personal time that they might be interested in taking a look at. Got you. Um, well, <laughs> when I'm with with my wife, I'm watching like Queer Eye. We're watching Queer Eye, the new season of Queer <laughs> Eye. I most a lot imagine a lot of people are like find it odd that Osito is sitting around watching Queer Eye, but British Bake Off. Um, mm -hmm. But as far as like scripted shows, uh, I've watched shows that I really enjoyed recently. Dope Sick. If you haven't seen Dope Sick, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, recently or not so recently mayor of east town is a good one i like a good crime drama i've been watching the rookie on abc a lot which is you know okay. um it's just like a it's to me it's kind of a fun watch it's you know it's a it's kind of this a similar thing every kind of episode but it's one of those shows that i can put on and it's like i can pay attention to it as much as i want you know um but yeah, I if if I'm watching something, it's either going to be like a drama or I love a good documentary. Comedies, obviously, I love a good comedy. Um, I love like Family Guy, American Dad. Like I, I love all those shows. So um, and obviously, I have kids, so lots of Disney stuff, <laughs> Marvel. Um, I can relate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've watched Frozen and Frozen Two and Moana more times than I can tell you. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it, man. Hawkeye, I finished Hawkeye. I love that. Um, loved it. Great. Yeah. I reviewed that one. That was so good. Um, yeah, it's it a very great. very well done, a very mm -hmm. well done show. So, but I mean, that's I mean, Marvel. All of the stuff that they've been putting out has just been just on another. Would step. you would you ever consider working with the MCU? I mean, I, I, look, look. Your 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 rocket ship is almost Thank the mark. Let, let, let me hit my people. I got some people in Marvel. Let me hit them up and, and see what we can do because there is a place to put you in there. I know exactly where you should go. So let me hit my people up and see what we can do. But in getting you out of here, we did ask Rebecca Cutter this last question from the fans. Mm. Because you're in the stars universe, you mm -hmm. know, with their stars and their shows. Fans asked me to ask Rebecca, would she ever consider doing a crossover with some of the other star shows, such as Power, P mm -hmm. Valley, any one of the other shows? You know what Rebecca said? She said yes. So then that lends me to ask you, could you see yourself enjoying doing a crossover with some of the other star shows, some of the Powers, some of the P Valleys, anything like that? Absolutely. Um, Stars has, a, and this is obviously going to feel like bias, but Stars has a very impressive roster of yes. shows, you know. Um, P Valley is amazing. That's one that I was just, as soon as I saw, you know, what that was when there's the deadline article came out, and I was like, this is going to be good, you know. And Brandy yep. Evans, somebody who I know, a good friend, uh, fantastic on there. That I mean, just what they're doing, it's like, Shakespearean at times, you know. Um, but yeah, the uh, Osito in the power world, yeah, sure, why not? If they, I don't know how you would make that happen. What <laughs> has to happen to make that happen? But if it did happen, I'm all for it. So, I mean, we we've been dreaming a Stars Universe team up where you have Power, High Town, and P Valley all in the same show. So, you yeah. know, y'all going out to party instead of going to Xavier's, <laughs> you, you go to the bank. <laughs> go to the bank. Go well, you know what's bank. interesting is that um, Shane Harper, who was junior in season one, is now on Power, Power. Force. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. if you're not, uh, definitely check that one out. It will be good. Absolutely. You guys already know I'm going to be reviewing it, trying to get some interviews with some of those individuals coming out in February. We'll be ready for it. Absolutely. So what's ne what's next for you, Atkins? Where are you going next as we get ready to get you out of here? What's what's next on your your um, dossier of shows? Anything in post production? Where are we going next with you? 
Um, I have a project um, that I was filming a few months back um, that's going to be on BBC and Netflix. And uh, it's called Inside Man. It should be out. Um, I'm not, they haven't released a date yet, but later this year it'll be coming out. It's a mini series. It's, man, it's going to be really good. It's with Stanley Tucci, David Tennant. It's got some amazing, amazing actors in it. And um, I'm really excited about it. So definitely be on the lookout for that one. Absolutely. Well, Atkins, we we are so grateful. Again, thank you for giving up your time and sharing it with us, being candid and taking this taking this interview in kind of a different direction from the traditional, giving it a little bit more fun, a little bit more flavor. And that's where I come to giving you the other nickname for you. You know, there's a great nickname that I'm sure your wife will love. Your Atkins <laughs> Estimate. I can envision you when you get on the stage and you receive your Oscar that the fans is buzzing, the essence of Esteban, like some <laughs> some brand new cologne men spray on, the essence of Esteban. That's what the crowd is saying. The essence of Esteban comes to receive his Oscar. Brother, I'll be the first one to buy that perfume or cologne when you start selling it. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate it. I will take both of those monikers and, and run with it. So uh, thank you, thank Lamont. You. Appreciate you so much for for setting this up and, you know, uh, keeping it going. And, uh, you know, uh, thank you, man. That's all I can say is, is appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate you guys, man. So get on out of here, family, man. Thank you. Definitely. I'll keep in touch with you. We all want to know what you're doing, where you're going. You always have a home here for us to let people know all the good things going on in your life. So good night. And we appreciate you, my brother. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Moochie. All right. That was <laughs> good. Got, got another one in the books, man. This this dude, he I'm telling you, that dude going places. He going places. Yeah. Like I, I I don't even I don't even think people see the groundswell. It's not even just about a seat it's about him. That it's 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 a it's something about him, and I don't even know if people are paying attention to the groundswell surrounding this man because Aceto just really kind of put on the mainstream because I went back and looked at some of his other stuff too. Dude can act. But I, I think everybody needs that one show where everybody's like, oh, I'm paying attention now. You somebody to be reckoned with. And everybody in that cast is somebody to be reckoned with. Mucha. They all got it going on. All of them. So... Well, yeah. I'll be I'll be put I'll be promoting y'all show tomorrow night. All um, right. You know the ladies. When I get Dominique up here, he was the muscle. We'll see what we, he gonna talk about, and we'll make it fun. I'll even let you come up here and ask him a question too. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All <laughs> right. Yeah. I'll see you tomorrow. Later, y'all. Later. <laughs>